Journalist and author Seema Goswami integrates sharp journalistic insight with a defiant reimagining of India's political landscape in Madam Prime Minister. Here, a formidable young woman is at the helm of a country and family legacy. She is Prime Minister. In conversation with Shivani Sibal, Goswami discusses her ambitious political thriller. Seema Goswami is a columnist and author. Her long-running columns, Spectator in Hindustan Time Brunch, has a vast and dedicated following. Of her several books, Woman on Top became a bestseller and was translated into several languages. Shivani Sibal is a Delhi-based author whose debut novel, Equation, was launched in July 2021. Set in New Delhi from the 1980s to modern times, the novel traces the story of social change, ambition, and family bonds. Both of them will be signing their books, so do get your copies from the bookstore. They'll be doing it after the session. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Mine is. Close up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it is working now. So, Seema, hello, great, Shivani. great to see you in person. And hello, Jaipur. Thank you for turning up for the session. I was convinced everyone's going to see Shashi Tharoor, so I really appreciate your choosing me over him. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, actually, uh, Seema, everyone loves your column in Branch. Thank and you. And I have to say that during the pandemic, I don't know how you thought of all those things to write about. The rest of us were like basically staring at a wall, right? You know, actually staring at a wall is very good for the soul because it makes you dig deep to find something to say. And I have to say that for the first year or so of writing the column in the pandemic, which lasted for like two and a half years now, yes, it was easy because it was all COVID related. But after about a year, I thought people must be really tired of me talking about how to cope with COVID how to make the best of your home, how to cook your meals together. Actually, like I think it resonated with what all of us were going through. So it was nice to find that yeah. mirror every week. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. But you know, over to Madam Prime Minister, I really enjoyed reading it. I, I, I read it uh, when I had my obligatory route with Omicron in January. <laughs> you know, and it really helped a very, very, very annoying time pass a little bit quicker. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just, you know, to jump right into it. Mm -hmm. You know, the first thing that struck me is today talking about politics and writing about politics is it's a landmine, you know, you have to be very, very careful. Yeah. So did you, and looking at the amount of political commentary that is in fact in the book, did you have to work very hard to circumvent God knows what, I don't even dare say what? You know, it's funny because uh, people always uh, treat politics like a bit of a hot potato these days because you're so scared of saying the wrong thing and being trolled on social media and maybe in real life too. Which is why I made a conscious decision when I wrote first Race Coast Road and then Pri Madam Prime Minister that I set it not in the present day. In my book, Narendra Modi has come and gone, Manmohan Singh has come and gone. It's like in the near future. And there's a completely different uh, political landscape. Yes. And none of the characters and none of the themes are actually that based in today's world. It's a kind of, uh, it's set in, I won't say never, never land, but sometime, <laughs> sometime yeah. in the, I mean, the themes are topical. See, but is that something conscious to avoid You know, it's not conscious. That's, that's exactly what I'm getting at. Uh, it wasn't conscious because I wanted to avoid getting in trouble because I think I probably may get into trouble even this despite doing that. This is true. I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to write a story which would be appreciated as a story on its own. And it wouldn't get bogged down in the politics of the day. I didn't want people to say, oh, you know, this is BJP and this is so-and-so uh, and this is Congress. I wanted it to be in a landscape in which my story would be the star and not so much the political people who we see around us. So, you know, that's, that's really interesting that you say that because I think a lot of us would avoid writing about politics for exactly that reason. Yeah. That we don't want our stories, our hard work, to get lost in like one sentence you may say somewhere yeah. which somebody is, uh, you know, not happy with or whatever. Um, 
But you know what I found right in the beginning of Madam Prime Minister was uh, there's a scene where uh, Asha Devi is being sworn in. And uh, she's sitting in the first row and uh, her interaction with her step family. Is step family a word, Seema? Yes, it is. Yes, yeah, it is. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> with her step family. You know, there is, it's, it's so complex because she wants their approval, yet she has to be a little distant from them. You know, it is uh, something so universal and so relatable. Now, do you feel that modern families in India somewhere are going to be functioning like this? Tell us a bit about that. You know, uh, more and more, actually in politics, there are a lot of blended families. They are rather Be modern, yes. Yes, because there are many, many politicians, we won't go into who they are, who do have two families. You yes. Know, not just young politicians, but much older people as well, uh, some in the south, uh, some in the north. And uh, I think that family dynamic is very, very complicated. Because even if you take somebody like Akhilesh Yadav, who yes. has a stepbrother, who has a stepsister-in-law who went and joined the BJP before the election. And I just thought when I was writing the story that instead of just doing a family dynamic, which in some ways is quite stereotypical, it would be nice to examine the dynamics of a step family in which there are all these pulls and pressures. Um, the heroine of the book, Asha Devi, is the only child of her mother. And she has two stepbrothers who are from the first wife. Yes and who are treated as sons and heirs, and she's very much treated like an also-ran. And it just so happens that she ends up becoming prime minister, and the pressures that that pull puts on her family are actually, I thought, made for some interesting uh, insights into how families evolve and how their yes. relationships change. I feel this is something that could be transported into a business family. There's so many other circumstances yeah. in which something like this could be Absolutely. So, yeah. uh, you know, what do you think of politics as a business? <laughs> well, isn't politics a business now? I mean, everybody treats it like a career. It's no longer about ideology. You have people who have kind of grown up in the Congress ecosystem who, without a thought, change over to the BJP, even though the ideology is so very different. Doesn't that prove that it's a business, it's a career? Yeah, no, in fact, I was looking at someone like Asha Devi, right? She's 29 years old. She reminds me a lot of my younger cousins. She, you get the yeah. sense that she's a very young woman, which, you know, it comes across very well. And, you know, honestly, I am so relieved that all my uh, the misdemeanors of my youth were before social media. <laughs> it is a real relief that is all erased. I have a yes. clean record. But Asha Devi did not have this uh, yeah. privilege. Yeah. And, you know, with this one unfortunate data leak, it will never be... Erased. erased, no. Now, do you think that India would have a prime minister like that, that they would accept somebody mm -hmm. who has this kind of video for everyone to see at their will? You know, it's funny you should say that, because if you look at America, for instance, uh, would you ever have believed that they would have a first lady, uh, Melania Trump, who had done naked photo shoots, which were like all over the place, which were released by the media when her husband was running for president. He was running as a Republican, which is the party of conservative family values. And it made no difference. You know, so, so maybe people are changing. Maybe, uh, maybe not so much in India, but who knows, 10, 20 years from now, we may have reached that level where we can ignore these things and move on. You did say this book is set in the future. But you know, specifically to what you said about Melania Trump, she is the wife of the president. Yeah. This Asha Devi is the actual president. prime minister, yes, exactly. right? And I feel something like that. I mean, for such a young country, we don't seem to be very forgiving to youth. No, we're not. <laughs> you know, we we're we not. don't. And, you know, that makes me think. Also, for a young country, we don't vote for the youth. I mean, most of our young people are actually fans of uh, Mr. Modi, who is quite uh, old right no, now. No, and right? also... A lot of the uh, no one seems to idealize. I mean, maybe because young politicians are changing parties with the speed. I suppose when the choice is difficult. Rahul Gandhi, it's hard to idealize him. But but you know, specifically <laughs> to Asha Devi and her uh, p her power, or uh, she doesn't. She has a lot of uh, illusion of power, but her hands are tied in so many different directions, so many different ways, and all the power she wields is through patriarchy because she is her father's daughter without which nobody would give her a second look and that comes across yet she's trying to make her own she's trying and i like the complexity in that and without giving way too much everything she has 
she has to bargain with somebody, she has to appease somebody. Every day of her life seems to be yeah. that kind of appeasement. T tell me a little more about that. Uh, you know, uh, Shivani, when I wrote the book, uh, I'd, the reason I didn't want to set it in today's day is because the present central government is all powerful. There is no yes. time for compromise or worrying about other people thing. They do what they want and, you know, take it or leave it. That's how it is. Uh, my book is set in an era which harks back to the coalition era of politics, you know, the UPA days or whatever, when there were like 10 or 12 parties in a coalition and everybody had to work together, where there were pulls and pressures yes. on the prime minister. And it's an attempt to kind of get into the mindset of somebody who has all these competing interests that she has to balance in order to make a difference. And whether she manages to do that or not is basically the story. In a way, that's a mirror for India, right? There's so Absolutely. many competing interests. Yeah. And if one person has their view alone, I, mean, I don't even want to say anything more. But <laughs> yeah, just, just you know, kind of leaving that, leaving that out there. Um, you know, they say, Seema, never ask a question to which you already know the answer. Okay. But I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> you know, lots is written, Delhi elite, Latians people, some of it by me. <laughs> but how much of it is true? How much of it is false? How much of it is partly true? You know, I find it really funny that the people who talk about the Latians' elite are the people who actually live in Latins' Delhi. I don't. <laughs> you don't either, I think. No. Oh, you're on the fringes, I think, of Latins' Delhi. <laughs> you know, I recently someone was asking me in an interview, you know, what market you like to go to? And I live pretty close to Khan Market, <laughs> but I didn't actually dare say Khan Market because that, it's become so tainted. Yeah. But, you know, did you feel that... But it's very know, hard it's, to it's, get away from it, isn't it? This Latins' Delhi has become a kind of a shorthand for the old elite. Yes. It's, it's become a shorthand for English speaking people for want of a better term. And uh, it's become a kind of a pejorative, I uh, like Khan Market Gang, uh, for people who are from the ancient regime because the new regime is more like, you know, son of the soil kind of image. They don't want this image of going to five star hotels. They don't want the image of shopping in Khan Market. So that is left for the likes of us. I'm not letting you get away from the question. <laughs> Were any of these people based on anyone real? You know, the characters are not based on any one person. Like, it's not like A is Rahul Gandhi or B is Priyanka or C is so-and-so. But, you know, I've done political journalism for a while now. And I've interacted pretty closely with all the yes. politicians. So what happens when you sit down to write a book is you're always picking up elements of the people you've met over the years. You're picking up little mannerisms, you're picking up, you know, everything is copy. So you kind of put it all together into a composite character. And sure, they will have shades of, you know, maybe sure. uh, Lalu Prasad or maybe Mamta Banerjee or even Mayavati. But I don't think the characters themselves are like based, uh, are prototypes of any one person, if that you, makes you sense. You know, you said something interesting that you seen many politicians, I won't say come and go, but you, you, you've seen many politicians. Do you feel there's a change in the kind of uh, demeanor they hold, the kind of uh, values they hold? Like, how, What do you feel has changed amongst? You know, when, when I started uh, doing political journalism, which was like in the late 80s, uh, there, was, there was a lot of, uh, I, I won't, access is probably the wrong term, but there was a lot of openness. People spoke to you openly. They had no uh, compunctions about giving you interviews. Uh, you kind of even got close to some people. I won't call them friends, but you certainly became friendly with some yes. politicians. I think now people are very, very uh, suspicious of the media unless it's somebody who they know is on their side. And there is an element of not opening up, not giving information. And uh, so that has changed. So, you know, to bring that back to your book, like what happened with Asha Devi in the book, m maybe people are more suspicious because they should be. Somebody could be recording them at every minute. Like the way that mm -hmm. uh, people are watched today, maybe they weren't tw even 20 years yeah. ago. Like what made sense in 2006 may not make sense today. Yeah. So that's, you know. Yeah, you have things like Pegasus, which, uh, which is probably the most intrusive thing that's ever happened in India. Not that anybody seems to care very much, but it was 
I mean, people could turn on your microphone without you knowing. They could turn on the camera of yeah. your phone without knowing and could intrude into every aspect of your lives. And you know, someone like, say, Asha Devi, right? She is somebody who is a modern person. And again, you know, I'm trying to situate this book in any kind of context. So she could be a young girl in a family where, uh, you know, her in-laws discriminate against her because something like this has happened in the past. She could be in a business, she could be anywhere. Did you want her to be a character that resonates everywhere? Well, I hope she does resonate everywhere. Uh, you know, my idea was to write about a, write about a woman who's, uh, who derives, like you said, her power from the fact that her father is the prime minister. Because that allowed me to examine the dynamics of dynasty, which is a huge element in our politics today. Yes. I mean, wherever you look, whether it's Maharashtra, whether it's Uttar Pradesh, you have dynasts in power. And I wanted to examine dynasty and see how it functions. Like when you derive your power from your parent, how does that work? So Asha Devi was actually a way of examining that for me. You know, the other part uh, of your book, which I found really enjoyable, was your depiction of the media, right? Yes. And I think... I enjoyed doing that. <laughs> you know, I, I would imagine, again, you've seen a shift in... I don't know how many years you can enlighten us. That things have changed so Absolutely. fast that someone yeah. like me who's an outsider yeah. won't be able to even tell when it happened, what happened, but things are very different, very aren't different, they? Very different, yeah. Tell us in about fact, that. Uh, as I said, I started uh, in journalism in 1987, actually, right. as a trainee journalist with Sunday Magazine, which doesn't come out anymore, and did a lot of political journalism, covered a lot of general elections and stuff like that. And, you know, in those days, the media was about the news. I mean, we spent a lot of money news gathering, we traveled, we spoke to people, we interviewed them. What has happened in recent years, I feel, especially in the TV media more than in print media, is that it's become all about opinion. That I can't yes. remember the last time a TV channel did a proper news story in which they send somebody out. Maybe NDTV does that to some extent with... So uh, where are they getting all this information from? Like where is so it it's from? basically, you know, they get copy from ANI, which is ah. like a source. So they would run that clip, like one clip of something that's happening in, say, Lucknow. And then you gather, like, you know, 10 people in a studio or in studio links. And then you just sit and chat about it, which is actually the most cost of effective. effective way of doing television because you're not spending money on anything. Because your guests are free, their opinions are free. All you pay <laughs> for is the anchor. And you've, uh, and you've actually just uh, taken one clip from a news service and run it. So news channels no longer give us the news. All they give us is their views. And that, I think, is a huge lacune in journalism today. Because you go back home in the evening, you turn on your TV, and 10 to 1, you will not learn anything new. All you will learn is, all you will see is like 10 people shouting at each other, and the anchor shouting louder than anybody else. And I'm not sure what purpose that serves. So. You know, I think another aspect of that is WhatsApp University. I don't know how many people are even getting their yeah. news from yeah. television anymore. Yeah. Uh, there's all these videos that are all going around. Nobody knows. Twitter, I don't think people Twitter is a huge thing. actually know what's real or fake anymore or yeah. care. Yeah. And the more we get into our own echo chambers, the more we only talk to people who think and talk like us, which I think people are closing ranks. What do you think? They are wanting Absolutely. to be around people who resonate yeah. what they say. Yeah, echo chamber is the right word actually because uh, we kind of listen to just people like us and the people like them listen to people like them and it's, you know, I think that's also a reason when you look at uh, when the recent Uttar Pradesh election happened, there was one section of people saying that Samajwadi party wants to win, uh, will win yeah. rather, another saying that BJP will win. Not because they have any great uh, stake in the Samajwadi party winning, but because they're only listening to their own, yes. own people. They're not kind of opening their ears to what's happening on the ground. And they're stuck within that one milieu, which they're just listening to like-minded people. And that is, that's not journalism, really, you know? That's propaganda. No, and if somebody doesn't start listening to somebody else, nobody's going to change their mind. Absolutely. Somewhere, and I feel we're getting, but then now, you know, we're, we're digressing from... Yeah from the subject where we came with, you know, politics, the national obsession. Um, it, you know, this can be a separate session and so yeah. on. But, you know, 
you write a very successful column, and the format, uh, how many words is it, Seema? I actually it's don't know. It's about 900. How long does it take you? Uh, not very long. It takes me a very long time to think of what to write. But when I'm writing, it doesn't take very long. Yeah, so whenever I want to be left alone, I say I'm ideating and I stare out of a wall. <laughs> I don't know if you, So, you know, the two formats are so different. And your writing is so different in each of them. Which of them is a more enjoyable and fulfilling process? You know, I don't know about more enjoyable, but writing a column is much easier. It's much easier because you have one theme and you're writing about that. And by now, you have your voice, so you know what you want to say. Writing a book is complicated because there are like 10 characters, all of whom have a different voice, all of whom have different uh, motivations. And putting it all together, I think, is far more complicated. I'm actually, you know, when I write a book, I always regret starting it. I'm like, <laughs> why am I doing this to myself? And I'm very happy once I'm done. But while I'm writing it, I'm always berating myself because I find it tough. You know, it's interesting you say that. One of the publishers here told me, and I don't know what you feel about this, that writers actually hate writing. I do. I love they having They do anything written. not to write. Yeah, it's a really I, weird thing. I love the feeling of having written something and having it out there and have people read it. But the actual process is, is not fun. In fact, that person went as far as to say, and I quote, I don't know why they do it. <laughs> I will not quote who it but, is because, you know, true, they don't like that. You're constantly yeah. kind of, you know, double checking, you're kind of overthinking it, you're kind of uh, questioning every single decision you take when you're writing a book, like should this plot go this way, do I end it like this, you're never sure whether what you're doing is the right thing, so it's not fun. But it's great fun once it's done and your book is out and you're seeing it on the stands, then it feels great. You know, I actually always compare writing to working out, of which before my two bouts with COVID this year, I was an avid fan. You have a good workout or you have a bad workout, you just got to do it. Yeah. You got to sit there, you got to do it. Some days will be amazing, some days will be bad, but in the long run, it's going to... My idea of a workout is going for a walk, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, so I won't, I, won't, I won't talk squats and lunges with you, absolutely not. So now Asha Devi, are you done with her? Do you feel you this? know, I, I don't know. You know, when I started uh, writing Race Course Road, which was the first book in this sequ sequence, uh, I was actually in the middle of writing a spy novel. And I wow. decided to stop. I mean, I, I'm actually three-fourths of the I way. I see an angle of that in, in this. Yes, yes yeah. without giving away too much. Too much yeah. Part of it is, yeah. And so I, I stopped writing that and I did this. And then I did uh, Madam Prime Minister because I wanted to do the sequel. So I'm thinking I will go back to my spy novel now and maybe give Asha Devi a break and come back and see her in 10 years' time. See um, where she is. Did you ever think of getting into non-fiction? You know, uh, Shwani, it's funny. Uh, my first book that I did was non-fiction. Right. It was years and years ago when Random House first came to India. I did a book called Woman on Top. Right. Which was like an advice book for women who were getting into the workforce. Right. You know, interview tips and, you know. So much of the advice has probably changed now. Of course. I mean, I haven't even read that book in a long time. But I started with non-fiction. But I have to say I enjoy fiction more because it gives me a chance to kind of flex my imagination. And, you know, there's so many things that you kind of learn when you are in political journalism that you can't write in your journalism because... Th Going back to my original question, yeah. yeah. So there are things you know but can't prove and you can't write them, but in fiction you can definitely bring it all in. So, and that's great fun. You know, I was in a session earlier and somebody said to me I, uh, that, you know, are you worried about what you're going to say? I said, who's going to challenge me? <laughs> I literally know the subject. Who's going to say you're wrong, right? Yes, so exactly. that's the good part about yeah. fiction is yeah. you are the master of your craft, you are the exactly. master of your story. Somebody says it's wrong, yeah. who, who, who are, are you? Who, who are they to say so that? People right? still say that, but it's okay. <laughs> but you know, I think they should. Yeah. I, I think that when people engage with you positively or negatively, yeah. they're engaging. Listen, I'm just grateful if somebody reads it. Yes, I absolutely agree. <laughs> you know, when somebody reads your book, it's a, it's a fabulous yeah. feeling. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the characters yeah. that live in your head yeah. are now living in the head of, absolutely. of somebody yeah. else. Yeah, it's a great feeling. So would, what advice would you give writers who are on starting on the journey because oh. you have a range of experience of all kinds of writing. Yeah. What advice would I give writers? Just write. I think that's... that's I think, you know, um, like for instance, when you're writing a book, it can get overwhelming if you start thinking that it's, you know, it's 80,000 words or 100,000 words. 
but just start write 500 words a day let that be your target and before you know it you'll have written a chapter of 4000 next week you'll write another chapter eventually you'll get there i think it's that 500 words if you can get on your page 500 words you're happy with you're halfway there my God, my, I must say that my expectations of myself are much lower. I used to do 200, okay? You are saying 500, okay? I'm feeling shamed. Can you see me turn red? <laughs> as, long as, as long as they're good words. <laughs> yeah, or oh, they're even words. But, that, but there's a point when you say words. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Kuch bhi, it's all fine, right? But I have to say, Shivani, I really enjoyed your book. Thank you. And I, I told you that you when did. I read it. But it was such an amazing insight into how Delhi is changing. And you managed to do it just by telling the story of two families, which is a very hard thing to do. That's so kind. So I really, really enjoyed you that. You know, I think that this story would not have made sense 15 years ago. I don't think it, yeah. could, it would have been something If you guys would have haven't bought. read it, please do read Shivani's Equations. It's a really great book. Okay. Yeah. While I totally enjoyed this plug, <laughs> yes, yes, please read it. I'm going to throw the uh, audience questions on now. So if anyone has any Thank questions, we can, we can take them. Anybody? Uh, yes. The, the lady in the green sari and the white pearls who just raised her hand. Yes. It's just a string. <laughs> I've been resisting glasses for years. Years and years. So, uh, I've been reading your columns for quite some time. Thank you. Uh, and um, this book too. Uh, do you feel, uh, at the back of my mind, I am much older to you, so I've been reading otherwise also for a very long time. Do you, nowadays, with Netflix and Amazon Prime and all coming in, the younger lot like you, do you actually, because I felt that way when reading your book, do you write a book keeping some, is it somewhere in the back of your mind that it, it is easy to, it's a very imagery uh, filled book. So, so that it will lend itself to a good series or whatever. Ma'am, I'm not that much younger. Thank you for saying that though. <laughs> but um, I take your point. Like, do you write with an eye to Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever? Uh, to be honest, I don't. I am a visual writer and I'm a very descriptive writer. So I think when you read the book, you probably have images of, you know, how it goes. And uh, I think uh, the way I write, I like to put a little cliffhanger at the end, end of each uh, you know, chapter so that people go and read the next chapter. But that's basically because I want people to read my book. Maybe one day somebody will make a web series out of it. I hope so and make some money. But <laughs> I don't write with that in mind. But um, I'm sure uh, you know a lot of people do, and full power to them. But also, you know, it's quite a uh, gamble to write a book in a way that you hope will be picked up for a web series. Because a book doesn't become a web series because somebody likes, likes it. it yeah. There's a huge, very long process, process that goes yeah. into it. Yeah. You have to rewrite it uh, with. The, yeah, uh, the script has to be. Yeah. It, it's not quite as straightforward as that. So yeah. I, I wouldn't say try that at home to anybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there was somebody else. Yes. The lady with the sunglasses. My God, we're getting somebody else in here too. Oh no, that's the other sound here. Yeah, so, uh, first and foremost, Seema, I love, love reading your columns. Thank you. You write uh, beautifully. Thank you so much. And, uh, my question is that you, and honestly, your unapologetic and uh, unabashed opinions. Uh, they're invigorating. Thank you very much. So, how about uh, satire and humor? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those are very different skills. I'm but I think you are perfectly <laughs> suited for it. <laughs> That's very kind of and you to say honestly, so. Honestly, there is, um, I would say, we don't have so many uh, humorist writers uh, right now. You know, yeah, writing true. humor and satire as a matter of fact. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, actually writing something funny is serious business. It's really, really tough to do. It's, it's writing a story, I feel, is easier than writing a comedy because trying to get laughs is a really hard work. 
uh, but I take your point. Maybe I'll try it in my next book. <laughs> Thank you. And also putting yourself out there for humor and your jokes fall flat. Yeah. The humiliation <laughs> is just too much for most of us to bear. Well, I well thankfully, if they're reading the book, I won't know that they're not laughing, so it's okay. <laughs> oh, the thing is, people have a way of finding you and telling you on social media. Nobody can any longer keep their views to themselves. I know. Can I, they? I, you know, I don't understand people who go on to Twitter to tag an author and say, I hated your book. I mean, what is the point of that? There are many books I read which I don't enjoy, but I don't run to Amazon to say how bad it was. But there's something about social media that brings out the worst in people. I, I mean, it's, if somebody was in the street, you wouldn't say, I hate you. Exactly. Right? But I think it's the anonymity, the idea that the person isn't in front of you. Yeah. The fact that human beings yeah. are ultimately a little bit cruel, right? Yeah, That's, exactly. Yeah. But you know, Seema, I remember an era, and maybe mm. you, know, you can tell me about this when everything we did wasn't documented so meticulously, Absolutely, right? Yeah. And a writer, I imagine, because I was not a writer at the time, and you were, could write a book and be done with it. Yeah. Now you have to flog yourself endlessly yes. in a way that's, frankly, I think it takes away from creativity. What do you think also, of that? Also, I think, uh, you know, there's so much pressure on authors to be on Instagram, to be on Twitter, to be on Pinterest, to be on Facebook to constantly, and I think that personalities of authors are not necessarily the personality of social media influencers. Yes. On the whole, they are much quieter, introverted people. I mean, I don't want to stereotype people. I'm sure there are many who love being Instagram influencers as right. well. But on the whole, authors do not enjoy Twitter and things No, so absolutely. And one of the reasons I'm and not... And it puts a lot of pressure on you. Yeah, to constantly be engaged interesting, humorous, at all. You can't yeah. ever switch it off, yeah, right? Like one yeah. of the reasons I'm not on Twitter is very frankly, I don't have that much to say. It's I don't have that many views, you know, I was, what do I say? I was tweeting about this um, session and I tried to find you on Twitter and realize you're not there. Yeah. Sensible girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not just opening up for like, uh, you know, my nonsensical views should not be shared with the, view, with the world on a daily basis. Sorry, we can get back to the questions from our side. Yes, please. Uh, hi, uh, you spoke about n news of 2020 uh, right now not being very authentic how it used to be in the two, uh, 2000s early. Right. And now it's just about opinions on who said who or what they wore or something like that. How do you get authentic news now? Like it's very hard to just find a good piece of news and Seema, talk about I, it. I'm very interested in the answer to this. Please tell me. You know, I think there are uh, some avenues where you do get some authentic news. I think NDTV still does some news stories and stuff like that. <clears throat> but speaking for myself, I rely a lot on news websites like, you know, Bayer and the Quinn, which are more independent. I rely more on newspapers like uh, the Hindu, the Hindustan Times, because I find they're less sensational. I don't rely on TV channels for my news and I don't rely on Twitter for my news because there's a lot of bias in those channels. It may be for one party or the other, but you're not getting a very unbiased view of what's happening in the world. So I try and find, you know, outlets that I can trust. But it's something that you really have to look around and, and uh, find. They're not that easily accessible. Yeah? I mean, I'll go as far as saying, is there a truth anymore? It's everybody I has their own know. truth, <laughs> I think. It's like that. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't think anyone yeah. will have a consensus on yeah. what is... True. Correct and wrong anymore. Sorry, who's next? Please, ma'am. Hi, Seema. Big fan. Hi, Love your you. uh, column. Thank you uh, so in much. In between your Lodi Garden walks and the books that you recommend and, of course, the books that you write, how structured is your day? And, I mean, what kind of discipline goes on? It's just very whimsical. You stare at the wall and then you sort of start writing. I just want to understand yeah. that process. To be fair, she never said she stares at the wall. It's me. I'm the wall starer. So, okay. so don't, don't, don't taint her with my habits, okay? <laughs> so, yeah. She had an opinion about it. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, yeah. yeah you know, I, you. I actually yeah. believe that staring at walls is good because I don't understand people who want a desk with a view. Because if I had a desk with a view, I'd never get any work done. So I'd rather have a desk that faces a wall because I can then concentrate on my work. But talking about structure of your day or whatever, you know, my days are not that structured because I do travel a bit. So uh, when I'm traveling, obviously, I don't, do my, uh, don't write that much. But like if I'm working on a book, then what I generally do is I take time during the afternoon when there's 
nobody around and there's no distractions or whatever. So I would write from say two o'clock to like six and I would finish my work during that period because you know before that there are things you have to do in the house and there are you know people making phone calls and that sort of thing. So I just keep that four hours aside where you do nothing else. And what I find when I'm writing a book is even if I'm not actually producing a lot on the page, I would still sit down on the computer and think about it because I think that thinking itself is important. So that kind of structure I do have, but I don't do it every day. I, I do take breaks when I'm traveling or, you know, and there are days like weekends where you want to take off or whatever. So that's basically how I work. You know, it's interesting you say that because I think writing is the final part of the actual act of writing. Mm -hmm. The ideating part is so much longer and Absolutely. you have a jigsaw part in your head. You're thinking of so many things. Yes. And then the actual writing is, it's, it's just putting it down yeah. because you, you don't think when you write. I don't know. Do you, do yeah. you do that? that you, you, you know, know? The, the way I work, uh, Shivani, is that I have like a vague structure in my mind of what I want my book to be. I have a vague idea of what's happening in each chapter, how many chapters there are or whatever. But I don't stick to it that closely. Like if I'm writing and something else occurs to me, I won't say, no, 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 you know, this is how it's supposed to yeah. be. Because sometimes characters take on a life of their own, situations become fluid on the page, and you just have to go where the story takes you. But it's helpful to have that scaffolding because that keeps you centered in your book. Yes. <clears throat> and I think once you have that, then it's easy to fill in bits. You can always come back and do a difficult bit later. You can do, you know, something which so, is So it's organic or, in, a, in, a way. in a very structured how do, way. How do you write? You know, I write very intuitively. I, I, uh, I said this in a session earlier today. So for those who were there, you know, forgive me for repeating myself. I write in a trance-like state. Mm. So I don't know what I'm writing. It is just all flowing out of my brain. And I'm so easily distracted that even if I look at a person, my concentration is broken. So this is hugely inconvenient, as you can imagine. <laughs> but back to you and the questions. Who's next? Yes, please, sir. Sorry. Uh, so uh, uh, my question is, most of the times, whenever we imagine women get, getting into power, it is always by, by inheritance, not you know, uh, starting it from the bottom. But again, I am saying it most of the times. Uh, why do you feel it is like that? And should it be? Uh, matlab, if we were doing opposite, it will you know uh, give inspire more people or more women. So yeah. Yeah, I, I take your point. <clears throat> Are you talking about the book in or about generally? In general, okay. Uh, well, in India, we have some examples of women who have come up without any uh, support from their family. You have Mamta Banerjee, who's uh, not had any political family backing her. She's the chief minister. She managed to beat the BJP in West Bengal, which was a tough election. Uh, you have Mayavati, who also didn't come from a political family. But I think in politics, unfortunately or fortunately, having being born into a political family definitely gives you an advantage because a you get a seat you have like a constituency that's handed down to you and that makes it much easier but that's not to say that it's a closed club and people from outside can't get in you know i somebody gave me this analogy that it's like you own a house which is worth 100 crores or you have to earn and save enough to buy a house worth 100 crores. Yeah, that is the yeah. difference between an yes. dynastic politics and, and someone yeah, who comes exactly, in. Yeah. And when you have to earn it, then you have other priorities as well. Yeah, I mean, you exactly. can't... So, you know, I, I don't think we're there yet, frankly. No, what I do don't you think, think so. I don't think so. I think, you know, um, the Aam Admi Party has actually opened the doors in some ways because it consists of professional people yes. like you and me yes. who are actually... Uh, concerned about how the country is doing and where it's going. I mean, whether you agree with their political ideology or not, you have to admit that it's not an insider's club. It is yes. people who are coming from outside the system. Like if you look at Raghav Chadda, who was in charge of the Ahmadmi Party's campaign in Punjab, he's a chartered accountant yes. who gave up his job, who, who camped out in Punjab for two years trying to forge this, you know, 
this victory for the Aam Aadmi Party. So I suppose in some ways things are changing on the ground, but I don't agree with this, you know, media narrative that now the AAP has become the national alternative because, you know, that kind of hype is unnecessary. They are in power in Delhi which sends like seven MPs and in power in Punjab it sends 13 MPs. So they account for 20 MPs in those two seats. So to say that they become a national alternative is also overstating it. But they have given us some hope that outsiders can make a difference. But you know what's interesting about what you just said is I read somewhere that now with the Punjab victory, AAP will have 10 MPs in Rajya Sabha, which will make them the fourth largest. Exactly. So yes. that's, you know, that's, 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 quite that's impressive. And you know, you yeah. see, again, say with someone like Asha Devi, she has gotten where she has because of fate. Yes. But say a lot of these people who've come from the ground yeah. up, you see a Raghav Chadha or somebody else at the moment of their glory, but what they went through to oh, get there, okay. I think that's your next political thriller. Exactly. What, what do you yes, say, Seema? Yeah. What Good does it idea. take to get where you are? Between the humor and this, I think. Ah, we have given up full of ideas, <laughs> right? Yeah. Sorry, who, who's next? Who's next? I, I think we're done. I think we're done. I think, Shreya, you have a question? Hi, Seema. This Hello. is a wonderful session. Let me introduce you all to Shreya, my editor at Penguin. Can I just say what a pleasure it was working with you? Thank you so much. Thank you. Though you abandoned us now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do take umbrage to one thing that you said, which is you will reintroduce Asha Devi in 10 years' time. You've left the book at a cliffhanger, <laughs> and I'd rather not wait. So... Could you let us know what plans do you have for Asha in the third part of this amazing... I will do no such thing. You're going to have to read the book to find <laughs> out. <laughs> so is it 10 years in Asha Devi time or 10 years in human time? Like is Asha <laughs> Devi 10 years older or are we 10 years older? No, Asha yeah. Devi is 10 years old. I didn't say I do it 10 years later. Yeah, I, I also know. Yeah. I mean, okay, I then miss her. Then yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Thank because you. That, was, that was worrying me. I mean, I can't wait that much. Thank you. So we've, we've read the book and we love it, but can you, for readers out here who haven't And that's it, Disha, who also works with Penguin and with me. <laughs> yeah, can you tell us what the book is about? Just yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read uh, Race Coast Road either, uh, which was the first book, which begins with like a political assassination. And um, so the prime minister is assassinated and this sets off kind of power struggle within his family as to who takes over. And his son is the heir, but at the end of it, there's a general election. And at the end of it, it is the stepdaughter, I mean his daughter, but the stepsister who becomes prime minister. So Madam Prime Minister takes off from there and sees her journey as a prime minister, all the pulls and pressures she has to go through, and of coalition politics and family pressures, and how she kind of comes of age in that job. Uh, but it ends on a cliffhanger, as you said. So we need another installment. How difficult is it, Seema, to manufacture all these cliffhangers? I can never <laughs> seem to figure them out. <gasps> Actually, it's not so bad. I, I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, do, do, you, you know, do you wake up in the morning thinking like, oh, I'm going to write this, I'm going to write that? Or that's sort of... You know, I'm, I'm really not the kind of person who thinks of my book 24-7. Oh, really? No, I, I kind of switch off. I mean, I have that period of time when I'm thinking about it and then I'm... I'm watching Netflix or reading a book or whatever. I, I'm not the kind who gets obsessive uh, with my characters or anything I, like Is that. Netflix the peak for all writers today? <laughs> <laughs> is that like everybody wants to, you, you know? know I, you know, to be honest with you, after Race Course Road come, came out, a lot of people did approach me to make a web series out of it. And I turned down like three or four offers. Really? Why? Because I wanted to write Madam Prime Minister and sell the books as a unit. As a trilogy. I didn't want somebody else to take that story forward. I wanted to take that story forward. And I am talking to some people now about turning both of them into a web series, which sounds... I Sounds think it'll like make a fun. fabulous web series and we all look forward to seeing Asha Devi. Fingers crossed. <laughs> she'll, she'll still be younger than me after <laughs> 10 years. So <laughs> look forward to it. Seema, thank you so much. Thank it was you, fantastic Shivani. chatting that was with lovely. you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You're a great audience. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Seema, and thanks, uh, Shivani. We also thank uh, Denik Bhaskar for their support. And both the authors will be signing the books uh, 
in the author signing booth, which is on my left and your right. Thank you. Uh, Francesca Cartier-Bristol, we've 